Meeting come to order and have roll call. <clears throat> Copeland? Here. McCain? Here. Wirtz is absent. Hyen? Here. Johnson? Here. Rust? Here. Hanfelder? Here. Trent? Here. Present. Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oops, I thought I turned that off. Time for public comment. Uh, I've been told that Gerald Moser, who is online, wants to give a public comment. Yes, can you hear me? Am I am I audible? Hello? We can hear you online on Zoom. Gerald, you're muted. All right, now can you hear me? Now we got you. Now we got, okay, all right, I'll, I'll, okay, I speak tonight as a citizen of Madison County, not as a faculty member. I would ask the question, how do you know when someone values something? For example, people often say that they value community college education and perhaps members of the Board of Trustees share this value. If so, I ask, how do you know that education really is a value for these people? One way to answer this is to look to their behavior, their actions. Generally, it is recognized that people will act so as to bring about the value they desire and endorse. What has the board done to show that they value education? The answer is unclear because the board routinely shows that it values money over other values. The actions to date all seem to dovetail on saving money, not enhancing education. I heard that they look at buildings, say the Nelson campus and ask how much money can we get if we sell it? There's no thought given to the service to students and the community such extensions represent. The value of our educational service to the community is considered less than the value of making money off of possessions they inherited from a previous board of trustees or when in, enticing established faculty to retire because the board believes their salaries and benefits cost too much, they are doing a disservice to education at Lewis and Clark, driving out very qualified and experienced teachers for untried and less experienced ones. Incentivizing retirement to save a buck is hardly consistent with a commitment to the value of education. We would want the best to be in our classrooms. This is not a wrap on new faculty. They will grow and develop just as those who have retired, but to push productive people out of the door before they had decided themselves to retire is counterproductive to quality education. It only reflects a commitment to mammon or pecuniary values. I do not paint all board members with this brushstroke, but simply raise the prospect that there is a deep level of disingenuousness to the motives of some. While proclaiming a respect for the value of education, their actions belie their deep-seated distrust of intellectual and academic achievement. An institution of higher learning, which Lewis and Clark is, requires adequate support to maintain its quality instruction, as well as its high standard of community involvement. Faculty, staff, administrators need fair and competitive salaries. Maintenance of buildings and renovations must be a continuous process of improving the physical learning environments for all students, not just those in modern construction. Activities for students must be maintained and even enhanced, such as for sports teams, student organizations, and campus events. Valuing education means taking actions to support these components of our college, thinning the faculty, restricting resources for athletics and student organizations, and passing the buck on renovating buildings in dire need of such are not the actions of people who value education. You may succeed in lowering your tax bill, but it's fair it's far from clear that you will be sustaining or enhancing the value of this college. Thank you. I went fast because I only had three minutes. Any more public comments? Yeah, I have another one if I can. Can I speak as a faculty member? 
appears to be none. Can I speak the as a faculty agenda? Member? Need a motion to approve that in its entirety, unless a board member wants to. I, to. Uh, oh, I, I jumped over. I'm sorry. Yeah, updates on the enrollment. Is yeah. Dennis Creeb? We'll move right into enrollment. The budget report uh, this month is going to be moved to next month. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. It seems like it's been so long since we've seen all of you. Uh, joining us this evening is Dr. Sharice Jackson. She's a new employee of the college, is the Dean of the Student Experience. And joining us via Zoom will be De Dr. Dennis Kreeb, the Director of Institutional Research. This evening, we were kind of asked uh, to do a deeper dive into enrollment and look specifically at some of the trends and information that we're seeing um, from a, a data, from a, a, a demographic perspective. And so what we've done and what we've given to you, and you should have a printout in front of each of you, is kind of tried to tell a story in about nine slides of what our demographics look like. So we're gonna have basically just a conversation around these nine slides that you see in front of you. Um, I wanted to kick things off um, by kind of giving the perspective and context for how we arrived at the information that we presented for you today. And so I bring your attention back to about two years ago um, when at the direction of the board we created an organization on campus called the Enrollment Task Force. And the Enrollment Task Force uh, put together a groups of people from across campus that were faculty, staff, administration participating in the Enrollment Task Force. And the idea was for the first time um, to really, really take a deep dive into enrollment, the issues around enrollment, how we advertise our programs, what kind of programs we have, what is really happening with enrollment. And that's um, about the time that we started to put data like this together. Um, Dr. Dennis Kreeb was instrumental in producing our first data book, for instance, that was a really inclusive look at enrollment trends over the past and how, where we find ourselves today. The documents that you see in front of you today are kind of a continuation of that conversation first began with the Enrollment Task Force. And they're updated to, uh, to reflect data as of um, September of this year. And they look back, uh, in generally speaking, over five years. And so with that being said, um, I kind of wanted to maybe uh, turn it over to Dennis on, uh, on Zoom, if we could. He will be, he'll be um, kind of telling you exactly. He created these, these um, charts that you're seeing in front of you. So he'll be able to kind of help us understand and, and, uh, and move along into that. Thanks, Brett. Uh, hello. <laughs> Thanks, Brett. Can I share this, uh, my screen with everybody? Is that possible to do? Brett, can, can they see the slides there? It looks great. Okay, great. So, yeah, as, as Brett mentioned, um, this is sort of a sort of a high level view in terms of enrollment trends and then we can we can answer questions that, that the board may have or others may have in terms of what we think is happening and what's uh, uh where, where these trajectories are taking us as far as enrollment so i'll go through these i'll go through these as quickly as i can <clears throat> to leave time for questions so this first slide is just taking really a look at enrollment and we're, we're splitting this by high school partnership and non-high school partnership to give some sense of the composition between those two so uh, as you can see Probably what's most noticeable this year is the high school partnership number has uh, has really significantly dropped, and that may be uh, uh, a part of our our uh, our tightening, I would say, of placement in terms of college uh, level courses and high school partnership uh, and other things. But again, you can see that's probably the most significant is the high school partnership enrollment uh, has dropped by really. Uh, probably for the first time, I would say, in, in at least a decade. So total enrollment, and this is showing the overall trajectory of that. <clears throat> Jump in and say, yeah. you know, to, to ex give you a little bit more explanation on that, keep in mind that there were several changes to the high school partnership program that we implemented this year that might account for that drop. The, the first one was a real emphasis on um, eliminating the practice of allowing mixed classrooms, which allowed um, qualified and non-qualified students to take college level work. We've eliminated that practice, so only qualified students are allowed to be placed in high school partnership in the first place. 
And the second large change that we implemented in high school partnership was the implementation of a $10 per credit hour fee. Um, and that's, that may contribute to this decline as well, but we'll know more as we move further down. Yeah, thank you, Brett. And that's exactly what happened. And, and so we've seen some, some change as, a, as a, probably a part of those changes that we made with the uh, high school partnership. Uh, this is looking at enrollments. And by the way, this is not looking at high school partnership. This is strictly looking at the um, non-high school partnership students looking at our enrollment by age and looking at the trends over a five-year period of time in terms of how those trends are moving. Uh, and again, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, our, our bread and butter uh, age demographics are those that are 18 to 19 and 20 to 24. And, and it's fairly self-explanatory to see how those are moving forward over the last five fall semesters. We did identify as well, um, one of our target demographics is the 30 to 39 age range. Um, so we definitely have opportunity there. So um, I am going to work with Terry Lane, who is our Director of Veteran Services and in Career and Enrollment Services as well, just to see some of those career fairs or job fairs, things like that, how we can get um, in front of those um, individuals, um, as well as getting into our community more to make sure that everyone knows exactly um, what we have to offer. Thank you, Cherise. Uh, this slide is looking at enrollment by part-time and full-time status. I've got to tell you, this is one that is intriguing to me. Our part-time enrollment has really been severely, uh, it's, 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 it's really sort of taken a hit, I guess, another way to put it. Uh, and I don't really have a quick explanation for this. There was a point in time when part-time enrollment was really kind of I would say for every three students, two were part-time, one would be full-time. But over the last five years, you see that full-time and part-time are nearly equal now. Uh, and so this is uh, a finding that we probably need to look at a little more closely to see what's happening here in terms of where have our part-time students gone. This is taking a look at enrollment by ethnicity. And uh, I think if there's one nice positive takeaway here, uh, African-American enrollment actually increased from fall 2020 to fall 2021. Uh, for the most part, the other demographics with ethnicity uh, fell, but uh, African-American enrollment did actually increase. So that was uh, a nice finding there. This is taking a look at enrollment by degree. <clears throat> so again, you can see over a five year period of time how degrees have changed in terms of those that were conferred. So we have our applied sciences, we have the certificates, um, AAAS, and again, you can just see how those are moving over time. Uh, some are doing better than others, but for the most part, we're looking at a downward trajectory for all of them, if you just, as an aggregate. Dennis, that this might be another area for investigation um, we can to look at specific programs. This will help us identify, you know, success, opportunities, a, a gap analysis, perhaps that Dennis was just working on might point to areas of opportunity in programs that we don't currently offer that we could be offering that there's a need or demand for. But d deep diving into this, investigating this would be another area. Part time is a, a, a definite investigation point. I would say this one is another. I agree. Yeah, for sure. So this is some, some data we, we, we put together that sort of, we're trying to kind of look forward here in terms of what we think is coming for our demographics or, our, or what we might expect for our district. Uh, and this is looking at what we would say projected high school senior class enrollments moving forward. And this data was taken from the ISBE, Illinois State Board of Education, and really just looking at class sizes from a kindergarten through senior class and pushing those out to see, you know, how are those senior classes look for our district high schools? Uh, and you can see this is done by high school. And so our largest high school is green, that's Edwardsville. You can see how they're gonna be moving forward, we think, in terms of enrollments for senior classes. And the blue would be Alton High School. This is what we think is gonna happen with their senior class enrollments. And the other ones are kind of bunched at the bottom. But again, giving sort of some sense of where the high school senior classes are moving for our high school. Uh, district high schools. And then I aggregate these. So if you were to kind of just, you know, put all those together and aggregate them, uh, this is what you get for, you know, kind of where we are now in the class of 2021. 
in terms of high school seniors coming out of our district high schools. And this is what we think is going to happen moving forward as far as high school seniors coming out uh, over the next uh, 11 to 12 years in terms of what we think is going to be around a 20% drop. I'm going to point out too that this is a demographic claim, right? This is population. It's based on population. So there's, there's not much we can do about this. But this really makes the things that uh, Sharice was talking about earlier, targeting that 30 to 39 group, absolutely critically important. Looking at career changers, looking at new programs that get people to come back and add additional certifications or qualifications, those kind of areas in the non-traditional age grab become very, very critical and moving forward over the next 10 years. Yeah, that's a good point, Brett. I mean, you know, there's gonna be really, the pie is shrinking, we think, in terms of those coming out of high school. So we'll have to be probably more creative, uh, a little more motivated to go out and find those students and penetrate those high schools a little better than what we have. Speaking of penetration, uh, this is, and this is from fall 2019, it's a little old, but I didn't want to use 2020 data because it was sort of an outlier year. But this would, what this is telling us is how we're penetrating the high schools. And what I mean by that is the blue line would show you the senior class enrollment and the red line is showing you how many of those seniors came to Lewis and Clark as a paying student. So you can see how we're penetrating each high school in our district. Uh, and uh, again, some of this is fairly stark in terms of if you look at Evertsville, which is the largest high school and our penetration there, we, we have probably, I would say, significant room for improvement. Uh, and Alton being the second largest, uh, we're doing a little better. But it gives some sense of how we're penetrating individual high schools. My question originally to um, Dennis and Brett was how do we track these students? How do we decide where they go if they don't actually come to Lewis and Clark? Um, definitely looking at Edwardsville, it was alarming to me how many students actually took those classes, how many times we were in the classroom, and then how many actually we were able to retain and actually came to Lewis and Clark. So I thought that was eye-opening for me and definitely an opportunity for us to look into. Yeah, thank you, Sharice. Uh, so we talked about demographics, Sharice mentioned demographics, and so again, just trying to get some sense of where this is moving forward for our district. Uh, this is what our Lewis and Clark's district composition by age band looks like moving uh, over the last uh, 10 years. And you can see that really most of the age bands, and by the way, I didn't include any, anyone over 50 assuming that those probably would not be the ones we're wanting to market to, but I did limit it to 49. Uh, the age bands, again, are falling. And at one point, you can see here the 20 to 24 year olds and 15 to 19 year olds were the largest by far. Uh, and you can see now <laughs> they're near the bottom. So as these are moving forward, the only two age bands that I would say that are, are, are holding steady or are, there is some growth are the 35 to 44 year olds. So that might be something to look at more closely in terms of marketing to see, you know, are these age bands here, a possible uh, market in terms of uh, possible students who may want to, uh, you know, change a career, retool, re-up their credential, whatever. But uh, I would say that those are probably the, the two, I would say, bright spots in terms of demographics, 35, 39, and 40 to 44. Uh, those are the two that may be moving upward rather than downward. And I think, Brett and Sharice, that's all I have on my slide deck here. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Question. It starts at 26,000 and then uh, drop. Is that black? Uh, yeah, black. and is that like all of them together, maybe, or that? Oh. No, the black. Uh, that I think I'm trying to Oop. match this up in my eyes too. Oop, I think it's page. forty. Yeah, forty-five to forty-nine is that top one. Right underneath it is the twenty to twenty-four years one. Okay. Yeah. All right. And you'll see that forty to forty, forty-five to forty-nine. If you follow it down, it kind of levels off. It's that continuous decline of the twenty to twenty-four year. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then also, you know, you talked about. Um, separating out the qualified and non-qualified, I think that was the term you used. That, by law, we had to do that, didn't we? I mean, or? Correct, that's to be in compliance with the Illinois Community College Act and, and the Dual Credit Quality Act, absolutely. So there were many years where that was not being done. 
Well, it, it wasn't, it, I would say that it probably wasn't the high priority in previous years. And so <laughs> it, it allowed our program to grow. It actually absolutely did. So I, I have a couple of questions. Um, so related to the mixed classes and um, yeah, I think the mixed classes and the qualifications piece, um, there are some opportunity to perhaps look, and we've talked a little bit about this, but look at some co-teaching. And this kind of goes back to something I believe Dr. Lane and I talked a little bit about this we had done in the past. I forget what it was called before. But this is fundamentally where if you have a high school instructor who isn't qualified because of ICCB guidelines um, to teach, say, an English class, that they could partner with a college professor and co-teach that class so those high school students can earn dual credit. The other piece of that is, um, you know, when it comes to mixed classes, having, having students who don't qualify, for example, through ACCUPLACE, or they don't maybe qualify to be in an English class, I'm just going to use English as an example, um, but you have students at the high school who do qualify, oftentimes most of our rural high schools do not have the resources to have two English instructors, so where do those other students go? It's another thing we're working on, and just having gone out, and I was going to give this a little bit of an update in my update, but I went out last week and visited, I think, 10 or 11 high schools, um, visited particularly with the superintendents and in some cases the principals, and there's, there continues to be a, a, a growing interest in finding some innovative ways to allow those students not to miss out on being able to take courses at Lewis and Clark. And one of, it came up at Brussels, at Brussels School is they just invested in a new technology classroom and they asked if they could use that to somehow asynchronously join Lewis and Clark courses for certain students. So although we see, I think, a downtick in high school partnership numbers, I might argue a little bit that I don't think it's because of some of the policies we've implemented. I, I, I just feel that we have the opportunity to open up some access points to schools. Um, although I would certainly agree that it is a factor, but the weight of that factor, I, I think I'd, I'd want to dig into that a little bit more. The other piece, the other question is when we look at, you know, the number of graduates moving forward from high schools throughout our district, remind me, I, and I, I couldn't, I, I, I don't think it is, you know, sort, sort of the, the market sort of penetration as we've sort of labeled it. So if we look over time and the number of graduates from any of these respective high schools who have gone to Lewis and Clark, like what, like in, in other words, every year over say a five year period, what percentage of graduates from Edwardsville typically come to Lewis and Clark that are A, either dual credit or B, just straight up, I'm going to Lewis and Clark for two years or one year or whatever it is. And if, and then if, and then what happens to the rest of those students, which right. is a whole other discussion and there are some opportunities yes. to address that. So just. The, the, the way we typically calculate that is that we look at those students who, who do follow on. We don't, we exclude high school partnership, right? Because right. that's, that's while they're enrolled as a high school. The follow on calculation, average across all district high schools is about 28%. That's going to vary by individual high school, and that percentage was not included on that chart. Yeah. But, but that, it, but it is known. We do have okay. that information. Okay. So, so in other words, we have um, we have seventy two percent, right, of right. students that go elsewhere, and considering we have the opportunity to sort of take a bite out of that market is really where the opportunity is. And, and I think there's, there's, you know, with the addition of Dr. Jackson um, and some other shifts we've made, I really feel, you know, as I think we all agree, you know, turning the ship around is not going to happen in a year. But I think over the next several academic years, we should be seeing, in spite demographics, there's still a market. There's still a, a significant percentage of students that we do not capture. And being a bit more intrusive, being a bit more strategic, and aligning a bit more with some of those expectations that our high schools have because of the resources that they may or may not have, um, the distance in which they are, or just quite frankly, just, you know, the vulnerabilities that they face, you know. Um, I think if we can tap into that in a deliberate way, I think we have the opportunity to get to get a lot higher than 28%. So. 
appreciate the update very much. This is really good stuff. I don't know any other questions from board members or anyone in the audience, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Thanks. Thank you, Dennis. Yep, thank you. Dr. T, are you going to introduce team members now? Or? I was taking a water break, I apologize. I do have, um, so since September, we have had seven new team members join the Lewis and Clark family, and uh, that is uh, Danielle, Melanie, I'm sorry, Melanie, Daniel, Jennifer, Hemphill, and I'll give the title. So Melanie is our uh, enrollment, in, uh, enrollment assistant for enrollment, uh, enrollment services, and her start date was uh, September 16th. We have Jennifer Hemphill, environmental technician for ANGREC, also September 16th. Uh, Dr. Streis Jackson, who you just had the pleasure of hearing from, uh, started on October 1st. Uh, Stephanie uh, Nuttall uh, was our manager, is our manager of grant operations and finance, and as you recall, that is a new position that is going to be underneath the College Effectiveness and Grant Development Department as a way to centralize grant development and grant management, so welcome Stephanie. Melanie Reith, who's our Division Assistant in Liberal Arts, started on September 16th. Uh, Christopher Roca, Land Conservation Specialist with NGREC, effective September 16th. And Alexandria uh, Valhos, who's our Student Success Specialist in our Student Success Center, who started October 1st. So just want to give a warm welcome to those seven new members of our team, and uh, we look forward to our work together um, collectively. So thank you all. Next is the omnibus agenda, and uh, need a motion to approve that, uh, unless one of the board members would like to vote on any item separately or items. Okay, have a motion to approve the omnibus agenda in total. Second. Second. Any discussion? Vote. Copeland? Yes. Hanfelder? Yes. Rust? Yes. Trent? Yes. McCain? Yes. Hyen? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Move on to action items. Need a motion to, uh, for approval of grant or sponsored contract opportunities. Have a Move. Motion. Brenda has second to that. Okay, Larry second. Any discussion? Roll call. Copeland? Yes. McCain? Yes. Trent? Yes. Hyen? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Rust? Yes. Hanfelder? Yes. Item B, change February 2022 board meeting date. Motion to approve that. Larry made the motion. Second by Brenda. Any discussion? Yes. Um, I would like to have that meeting at 7 p.m. Otherwise, I have a conflict. There was no mention of the time of the meeting in the, in the resolution. The board's in agreement. I'm I'm comfortable with that. I, I, I but it's for what this one meeting and we go back to six, yeah. Everyone okay with seven? Okay. You ready to call for vote? We, could, we need to amend the motion then. Need a motion to move the meeting time from six to seven PM. So moved. Brenda, a second? Second. Okay, any discussion on that? We vote on the amendment. Roll call. Copeland? Yes. McCain? Yes. Hyen? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Rust? Thank you, yes. Hanfelder? Yes. Trent? Yes. Now we need a vote on the change the date of the February meeting. 
Well, we've had that motion. We need to just roll call on that. Vote on the motion now. Yes. Sorry. McCain? Yes. Hyand? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Rust? Yes. Hanfelder? Yes. Trent? Yes. Item C, amended 2021-2022 college holiday calendar. Need a motion to approve? Brenda, need the motion to approve. Need a second? Second. Any discussion? Call for the vote. Copeland? Yes. McCain? Yes. Hyen? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Rust? Yes. Hanfelder? Yes. Trent? Yes. Item D, 2022-2023 college holiday calendar. Motion to approve. So move. Kevin, you need a second? Brenda, second, any discussion? Call for the vote. Copeland? Yes. Rust? Yes. McCain? Yes. Hyen? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Hanfelder? Yes. Trent. Yes. Item E, 2022-2023 academic calendar. Motion to approve. Okay. Motion been made, been seconded. Any discussion? Chuck. Roll call. Copeland. Yes. Trent? Yes. Hanfelder? Yes. McCain? Yes. Hyen? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Rust? Yes. Item F, student academic fees for 2022-2023. Motion to approve. So move. Chuck made the motion to approve. Need a second? Second. Second by Kevin. Any discussion on the fees? I just have a, a comment, not a, I, looking at that over two pages of changes, that represented tr a tremendous amount of work by, by the team, and I'm, I'm impressed. Any other comments? Call for the vote. Copeland? Yes. Hanfelder? Yes. Rust? Yes. Trent? Yes. McCain? Hyen? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Item G, resolution 22-3, evaluation of the president, motion to approve. I wanna make a comment if I could. Um, there, there was a, a request that, that it included all team members and I, I think we have clarification on that, but mm -hmm. wanted to make sure that was, that, that was part of the, the I right. think I think the revised one that Sue sent out okay. included that. Okay, great. Yes. Thank you. I had a motion. I need a second. Second by Brenda. Any discussion? Roll call. Copeland? Yes. Trent? Yes. McCain? Yes. Hyen? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Rust? Yes. Hanfelder. Yes. Informational items. Dr. Treska. So, um, you know, as I've done in the past, if there's any particular questions on any of those, um, I, I, I do, similar to what I've, I mentioned up in the hallway earlier, I'll talk a little bit about the main complex update and uh, if there's any other comments on that, certainly. But um, and everything else I think straightforward and information is on those respective pages, but please let myself know if you have any questions. If I can't answer those, I'll certainly call on the team member who would be able to do that, so. So on the main complex, if I could just jump to that. So as, as I've probably announced a couple of times already, on Thursday, uh, representative uh, uh, from ICCB, Matt Berry, myself, Mary Schulte, will meet with the Capital Development Board 
to discuss the scope of the main complex project. And, you know, all signals are pointing to, you know, um, the college hopefully being able to move forward with funding to uh, support the main complex project. Uh, the questions are really from us going to be around, is this going to be a grant award or is this going to be a different type of award? The difference of that is with a grant award, as Lewis and Clark Community College, we'd be able to control the scope of that project, uh, the management of that project from a financial perspective. If the money comes through a different path and the Capital Development Board has control of that, then um, it would require a match and we would have less control over the scope of that project. So um, Mary and I uh, and Matt will attempt to get some clarity on Thursday and then hopefully have good news to bring back to the team with our next steps moving forward. Um, and on that note, I do want to thank the full team. Um, I think everyone in your own way, indirectly or directly, has had an impact on the progress we've made over the last several months. I know it's been difficult with the closure of parts of our main complex and uh, the displacement of our students and many of our team members. So I'm just personally very grateful for everyone's flexibility and commitment and understanding to this change, but know that the big picture is always something we have to focus on and in two years, hopefully within two years, we can look back and say, okay, it was worth it, look what we have now, and then we continue to move forward as a team and as an institution. So I just wanna thank everyone and um, look forward to some good days ahead as it relates to our main complex and of course to other parts of our campus work. Thank you. That's all I've got, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Leadership team reports. Sure, so uh, we'll start off with uh, Dr. Jill Lane with academics, and we will skip the enrollment report since we did hear from, uh, from the team earlier, so thank you. Hi there, I just wanna give you a few um, brief updates tonight. Um, as of this evening, once the board approves it, you want me to take my mask off? Okay, is that better? All right, um, we have hired a Casely Sackman who's starting on October 18th as our full-time pharmacy tech faculty member and program coordinator of, of that um, program. So we're very excited to welcome Casey Lee to the campus. We are finalizing this competency-based education and welding with spring implementation. We are continuing to work on blunt flex classrooms across campus and on the Nelson campus. And in the meantime, faculty are able to rent out the 360 OWL cameras, which allow them to have a blend flex type classroom. I think last time I mentioned that we had been selected as one of 10 colleges in the state to work with women employed on a project called Accelerating Student Progress and Increasing Race, Racial Equity, or the Aspire Project. And they, they um, reached out to us because of our expertise in co-requisite remediation. And so um, four members of the team presented at a statewide presentation virtually on our program that we've had in place since 2016 that's just incredibly um, effective. And that was Dennis Kreeb, who you heard from tonight. I was a presenter, Randy Gallagher, math faculty member, and Justin Bernay, an English faculty member. So we really are viewed as the experts in the state when it comes to co-requisite remediation. We are well into our program review process this um, February, 17 either academic programs or student support services will be reviewed. And they spend nearly a whole year working on this pretty robust program review. They will present in February to the um, campus innovation and success team as well as to the academic affairs staff team. So I wanna give thanks to the folks who are working hard on those program reviews. We also have put together or finalizing um, a team of 10 writers to begin our 10-year um, accreditation self-study. It's a major undertaking and we've got a great group of people and um, we are, will be attending an HLC conference in April as we begin and continue to work on that process. The site visit will be April of 2023. So it gives us, you know, 18 months or so to get this. It, it's basically five chapters essentially where we have to do a self-study and provide evidence that we are meeting all the HLC requirements. But 
most of this team has worked together before, so I think we're, we're a good group to work together. Um, adult education, two of their programs, Building Futures and Youth Build, are working with Ameren, Illinois, and Senior Citizens Plus um, to install smart home technology in over 200 senior citizen homes in the Riverbend arena, and they're doing that at no cost to the senior citizens, so I think that's an excellent project. Um, and I want to recognize Val Harris and her staff for that. Um, I've been working with Dennis and Brad White in IR to run a gap analysis, I think Brett mentioned that earlier, where we can look for opportunities in our region where there are jobs available and not enough job seekers to fill those jobs, and that can help inform us where we might grow new um, CTE certificate and um, associate degree programs. And we are also working on better alignment um, of credit and non-credit CTE programs. Dr. T and I have been talking about that a lot lately, and we're gonna begin kind of in earnest moving forward on taking a hard look at how we may integrate those areas better. And then I, my last thing is just a quick congratulations and announcement to um, one of our full-time faculty members, Jessica Noble, who is the coordinator of our criminal justice program. She was appointed as chair of the community college section of the Academy of C Criminal Justice Sciences. So it's a big deal. They have over 1,800 members. And I just want to say kudos to Jessica. I think she's on Zoom tonight. I'm pretty sure she is. So if we can recognize her and give her a round of applause. Good job, Jessica. And that's all I have unless you have any questions for me. All right, thanks. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Lori. Good evening again. Um, I only have about 10 pages, so it shouldn't be too long. Um, I really just want to um, start off by giving special thanks to Tina Russell and our family health clinic staff. Um, and it has taken numerous students and uh, team members who have been volunteering to help us stand up our testing site on campus. Um, it was no small feat when the executive order was announced, and not only did they stand up the nasal swab testing that we did up into this week, but simultaneously in the background, they were also working on all the logistics to launch the SHIELD saliva-based testing, which I'm happy to say we are doing this week. We're providing more, um, we're providing about averaging about 500 tests a week between students and team members on campus um, and things have been running semi-smoothly. Um, a little glitch in our scheduling software with SHIELD but we've got that corrected now. Um, so really just want to give credit to that team, uh, our clinic staff and Tina for really helping us get that up and running. Also simultaneously I want to give credit to our IT department. Uh, they've been working daily and helping us create this tracking system uh, in order to be compliant with the executive order. It's been a uh, completely involved process with things changing daily and, um, and Sean Koppel, Ron Wall, the entire IT staff have helped us really kind of fine tune um, in terms of being able to track and notify our team members and students regarding compliance weekly. So. Um, in terms of our compliance, I just wanted to share with the board where we are today. Uh, we have 682 full and part-time team members, and um, in terms of those who are completely fully vaccinated, uh, we're at 71.7 percent, so I think that's a good number. Um, in terms of total compliance among team members, we have 629 team members who are fully compliant this week, so we're at 92 0.23% in terms of this week's uh, compliance. And uh, on the student side, we have 2,681 uh, credit students, which excludes our high school partnership numbers. Um, we have 46.2% of those are fully vaccinated, representing 1,239. And as I understand, we're, we're seeing that number move. Uh, we're, we're seeing more submissions of first dose vaccines that are coming in weekly. Um, and in terms of our student compliance, we're at 73.74%. So we continue to work on strategies 
to notify our team members and students of, of any non-compliance issues as we discover them each week. Um, and I am pleased to say that that number of non-compliant student and team members has been decreasing. Uh, we're starting our fourth week of testing under the executive order. So academic affairs and student affairs are working directly with those non-compliant students. And HR um, has been working directly with our team members and their supervisors in order to help us achieve that 100% compliance um, under that executive order. So um, I think... Uh, I'll, I'll end that there. I also want to just add that we um, are providing a report uh, daily to our leadership team, but weekly to the entire campus, and this is also on our website, where we're providing numbers of positive cases among students and team members, as well as total numbers of quarantine for transparency purposes. I think after today's report, we have no new positive cases today, and I want to say there were four student or four staff members who are currently in quarantine and about 23 uh, students. So we're kind of keeping an eye on those numbers and watching for any trends there. A couple of notes from HR. Um, just want to update the board on we will begin our annual all team compliance, uh, legal compliance training later this month. Um, team members will receive a notification as usual, and we're delivering all of this over our online uh, software training module known as Safe Colleges. The annual topics that employees uh, must be trained on, either because of a state or federal mandate, include the protection of minors policy, our sex-based misconduct, Title IX, and sexual harassment, anti-harassment, fraud, waste, and abuse, FERPA, which is our, our Student Privacy Act, and those who work with or have access to protected health information will also um, take part in their HIPAA compliance training as well. So employees will receive a notification either later this week or early next week um, on how to complete those and we'll have until mid-December until the campus closes uh, for the holiday break uh, to, to complete those. Uh, with tonight's approval, we currently have 28, excuse me, open job searches for a number of full and part-time uh, positions on campus. Um, I also want to note that the remote work policy mover team is continuing to meet. We're currently drafting that policy now and that will be brought to the policy board or the policy committee either in November or December with the idea and the hopes of adopting that finalized policy to begin January 1. Um, at the request of the personnel subcommittee, HR generated a report reflecting positions onboarded and offboarded over the last uh, year, so September 1 uh, to September 30th. Uh, of this year, sorry. And the report reflected that there were 42 new team members onboarded during that time frame. That's 29 staff, five faculty, and eight management team members. During that same time frame, a total of 50 team members separated from the college representing 34 staff, 11 faculty, and five management team members. Uh, with a new software, a campus-wide organizational chart has been re-envisioned, and it was also shared with the personnel committee earlier uh, this month. The new version post uh, organization changes to date is under review with leadership and as soon as that's finalized we'll send it to all of our board so you will have that visual org chart um, in front of you. Uh, from an operations standpoint, just a few notes uh, just to make the board aware, the college is working with the QEM Fire District as we are end, we're nearing the end of our 20-year lease agreement um, with the district for the use of the fire tower that's located in Elsa, as you'll recall. We have a new mobile fire tower, um, so the college no longer has use for that structure in Elsa. So a team uh, from Lewis and Clark, along with Ed Burnley, who is our fire science coordinator, is meeting actually Friday with the, at the QEM uh, site with the fire district to um, basically do a review of that property. Um, and once the lease ends October 21st, our hope is to, to finalize an agreement with them and we'll update the board on that as well. Um, in tonight's approved personnel report, the board did accept the retirement and resignation of our manager of facilities, Mike Randall, who has served in that capacity for nearly 20 years. So with his plans to retire later this year, myself and Chris Palda have started working on a reorganization plan for the maintenance division. Uh, we have four current openings as well uh, for maintenance positions, so we're taking all of that into consideration, trying to build a structure that will help provide um, support for the entire campus, um, for the managing of our facilities. As, as you guys saw we've uh, through the walkthrough today, we've got a lot of work ahead of us, as well as our, our capital projects going forward. So uh, we're looking, like I said, at a number of those open positions and hope to bring something to the board um, in November. 
is our goal. Uh, on the PR side, we're working, our work with Interact Communications is continuing behind the scenes. We're in the final stages of scheduling some focus groups that will be held with our, our current students, uh, prospective students, some uh, team members and internal constituent groups as well as external constituent groups so they can provide feedback to the researchers at Interact about our brand, about um, some web, web redesign concepts as well. So once those dates are finalized, I'll make sure that those are communicated with the board as well. Our website mover team is also in the final stages of, of selecting a content management system, which is the content delivery platform for our, our new website as we move forward. Um, and then one other thing I just wanted to note, um, if you'll mark your calendars, and I do plan to send something out um, th through either Dr. Trasker or Sue to the board, but October 22nd uh, from 5 to 7 p.m. on the N.O. Nelson campus, Tim Bell is organizing an event called Friday Night Lights, and this is to coincide with the, the final home football game in Edwardsville. Um, the, goal, the goals of the event, I should say, are student recruitment, alumni recruitment, and community engagement. So uh, we want to invite our trustees to attend, and uh, as I said, look for an, uh, a more formal invite. The idea is just to provide a sort of pre-game atmosphere for those who might be attending, or even if they're not attending, obviously we'll still welcome them. We'll have food, drinks, music, and information about college programs and services. So, any questions? Thanks, Lori. Thank you. Uh, Brett's gonna provide an update on information technology. Hello again. Uh, information technology, uh, actually three departments in, under my area, IT, institutional research, and grants. Um, inf uh, technology is the first topic. We have a couple of key openings that we're getting ready to fill in the technology department. We've been lucky and fortunate to hire a computer technician. We were short, and that's been really tough in this environment, so we're really happy to onboard them. You, um, that'll be uh, moving along now. Um, we're working with HR to uh, schedule interviews for the director of technology position. That's another key component of this newer reorganization that's going to be important. Um, as far as institutional research, uh, Dennis and Brad are working really closely with a third party vendor to make improvements to our Blackboard um, pyramid installation. Um, it's been maintained over time and there's some things that really need to be updated in order to take advantage of that. So the data that you looked at earlier was directly from that product. This work will help us improve and make that more consistent moving forward. And then finally, I've been working really closely with um, our director, Nate Keener on uh, it, the new grants organization, and we're really looking forward to moving, working with the new uh, grant accountants so that we can formalize uh, grant management across campus in those areas. That's all I've got for you. Any questions? A uh, quick question. This sure. is more of a small thing, but sure. recently there's been a really large uptick in phishing emails in the school's Outlook email system, yeah. and a lot of students are getting more concerned with that, and a lot of students and even faculty have fallen for that. Yes. Is there anything we can do to sort of look at that? We're, we're talking about a couple of things, actually, because um, we've noticed it as well. Um, one of the things is, obviously, it's, it's out there, and they're originating from outside of our system, right? So it's not like we're generating these things, so we're just receiving them. Um, so that's very frustrating. Um, what we're trying to do is work on two aspects. Number one, uh, make sure that we have the uh, security components in place to make sure that we can, we can um, respond when that happens, but also to increase consumer awareness. We need to work really closely. In fact, I was just talking with Ron Wall today about how we get a service desk for IT out front. You know, it's, it's really hard to find IT people. I mean, you can call the IT help desk, but you don't see them. You don't know where they are. They're just a, a, a bodiless voice on the phone. And so we really feel like we need to get a, a physical presence on campus where people can come up, bring their equipment, show them what's happening, talk to them about what, what is happening, what's wrong. Hey, should I answer this email? So I think that's all part of our strategy in combating that. But you're right, it is. It appears to be getting worse. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Thank you. Thanks, Brett. Good evening. As I thought about the report that I would give tonight, I was reminded that so much of what we do in our office is routine. It's not thought about until it doesn't go as expected. So what has happened since my last report that went as expected? Well, we've made purchases, we process payments and the like, but there's just a few things I wanna focus on tonight. Through the efforts of finance and financial aid, fall aid transmitted to student accounts late September. And looking at just loans, Pell, MAP, and Chapter 33 awards, 
1,733 awards have been transmitted to students' accounts, totaling close to 2.6 million. From there, excess credit balances are dispersed to students as soon as possible thereafter, and then third-party sponsorships are billed. You may have also noted that the personnel report grew in length this month in the area of the part-time and overload payroll. September 28th marked the beginning of the payroll for these, uh, this group of individuals for the fall semester. The payroll team has been working diligently with division assistants to confirm and set up compensation that spans the length of their classes for those team members listed. Another special focus for the payroll team um, of late was the prep work to load new salaries for the team members who were improved for base salary adjustments by board action last month. It was part of the, acceler it was the accelerated final phase of our most recent compensation study. As always, a joint effort with human resources there to be sure that our names and amounts align. Last month, I mentioned the addition of Stephanie Nuttall to our, the finance team as manager of grant operations. Stephanie did join us on September 1st and hit the ground running. And we've started her with a few system projects surrounding GATA, which is the Grant Accountability and Transparency Act, and SAM, the system for award management. She's working closely with others in the office to become acquainted with our reports and has already taken on a few grants of her own to get her feet wet. Stephanie is anxious to meet our various grant managers and the grant development team over the next few weeks. She's a great addition to our department. And at our next monthly meeting, I'm hopeful that we will be bringing forward two recommendations to replace our vacant accounting specialist positions. I also expect next month's board materials to include a next step in finances reorganization plan, pending the finalization of that job description and review by human resources and grading. And although mentioned last month, there's not an item to authorize the special tax levy as part of the board materials this month. The calendar allows for this to occur in November with the petition period before the levy is passed. Many years we do not get the extra time to wait until November. Uh, last year, Lewis and Clark received authorization for an additional 4.09 cents. This year's authorization from ICCB has been finalized and communicated to us, and that came in at 4.07 cents this year, uh, representing um, 1,868,000 before any levy adjustments. Um, I'm open to any questions. If there are none, this concludes my report. Thank you, Mary. And Dr. Hill. I think um, moving forward, too, on this, we have student ex engagement and student experience. So I think next month, Do Dr. Jackson, you could also provide some, some perspective um, from your area. So for Dr. Hill, if you, yeah. or if you want to come up, you're more than welcome to. So if you're ready. <laughs> Thanks. So there have been lots of things happening on the campus, and it's nice to see things getting somewhat back to normal. Um, the first thing I want to mention is our college counselor has been seeing students. The demand for has been very high. She and I will be meeting with media services later this week, and also the um, mental health expert panel will be meeting to try to figure out better ideas for programming and um, offering a health and a mental health services on campus. In terms of student activities, we have some new clubs and some very active clubs. Um, a drama club is planning events. A literary club is planning events, and um, our gaming club may be our most popular club on campus. They have a, a video game tournament coming up soon for those of you interested in video games. Um, it's actually a Mario Kart tournament, to be specific. Um, we were fortunate to have a few great events in the month of September. Uh, you know, the fall air is here, and it's, it's a little bit cooler, but. Fall Fest, which I talked about at the previous board meeting, we had great attendance, we had great weather. If I have a complaint for Fall Fest, it was that the wind was a little high. Um, you know, there are wind gusts here and there, but it was a beautiful day, um, virtually picture perfect. And then we also had one of our wonderful events in particular that we had was we showed Beetlejuice on the front lawn, um, and that was a, a nighttime movie, and we had a great turnout for that as well. We're planning other events this summer, I'm sorry, this fall. Um, 
there'll be a root beer float Thanksgiving party and a couple other things happening as well. And so we're looking forward to that. And as our students are slowly but surely kind of coming out of the shadows and we're providing events for them. The last thing I want to talk about is Talent Search and Upward Bound. So those are programs, just to be clear, that um, encourage college enrollment for middle and high school students, particularly students who are low income and students who would be first generation college students. The tricky part is, again, we're still having the issue where middle and high schools are limiting the amount of, of time that students can leave the, their actual campuses. So they don't want students leaving and possibly being exposed to COVID. And so what Talent Search in particular is doing, because we want to get students to college visits, is we're switching those to weekend and working to do that. That way they won't be um, pulled in and out of classrooms and they'll still get exposure to um, colleges in this area. And then Upward Bound is doing, continuing to do um, a lot of virtual counseling with their students. So we're trying to do things again to continue to give students exposure to opportunities and, and, and manage it in this kind of strange COVID climate. Any questions? Thank, Thank you. Um, just one quick update for student experience. We are right now in the phase of um, revamping our new student orientation. So right now it's just an information dump to our new students and we wanna make it more interactive, um, make sure that we let them know about the resources, the um, things that are available to them, as well as get them involved in the campus community. So that's one thing that we're working on. Um, another thing that is really um, dear to me is recruiting. So I am working with Ryan right now to try to get some recruiting events um, started on campus, um, get into the community to make sure that we're getting the Lewis and Clark name out. So any questions? Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Uh, Doug, athletics. Good evening. Give you a Trailblazer athletics update. Our fall regular season sports have about two to three weeks remaining. Women's soccer is currently five and three. Men's soccer is 10 and three, and that's worthy of a 16th rank in the country, which is division one soccer. Volleyball is struggling a bit. They've hit that um, national ranking grouping in our region, they're five and 13. The fall scrimmage seasons are concluded now for tennis, softball, baseball's fall season is nearly concluded. Uh, men's and women's basketball will start regular season here in three weeks at the beginning of November. Um, I've got two items uh, that I want to make you aware of with regard to athletics, and athletics has not been immune to job searches, uh, as you've heard from many people on campus. But in July, we lost our athletics trainer. Uh, we have one athletics trainer that serves our 150 student athletes. We conducted a search uh, from mid-July through today, and during that time, we've had one applicant. What we've learned is that there is an extreme shortage of athletic trainers across the country. During my first stint as athletic director, our athletic trainers uh, were part of a contract with Alton Memorial Hospital. And I've moved forward a request for proposal uh, to the administrative team to reconsider a return to such a model for our athletic training. Um, currently, we're utilizing three athletic trainers uh, from the staff of Dr. Omatola at Alton Memorial Hospital, and they are doing a wonderful job covering our game day events only. However, our student athletes at this point are sore and banged up and we need some daily treatments. And again, my recommendation would be for us to review 
uh, a possible return to that contractual agreement to retain some athletic training. Uh, my third item, every four years, the NJCA requires us to declare our divisional status. And that declaration is coming up here in the coming weeks. I have made a recommendation to the team to keep everything the same with regard to our, div our divisional declarations with the exception of one sport. I'm recommending that we take men's basketball from Division I and move it to Division II. My rationale is this will closely align with our women's basketball divisional commitment. It will align us more closely with Title IX. And in fact, I believe it will save us some money. Uh, it will completely eliminate housing scholarships and it will also consolidate some travel that we can utilize with the women's basketball team. Um, just to give you a rundown of what our sports currently are, I know this gets confusing because there's Division I, Division II, Division III across the country, and we have both. Uh, but our fall sports would not change. Men's soccer would remain D1. Women's soccer would remain D1. Volleyball would remain Division II. As I mentioned in our winter sports, I am proposing that we move men's basketball to Division II, which again more closely aligns up with women's basketball that is currently Division II. No changes would occur in our spring sports of baseball, golf, and softball. Those three are currently Division II, and men's and women's tennis would remain the same at Division I. Um, I'd like to entertain any questions if you if you have questions about our training situation and our divisional commitments. Yeah. Uh, could you clarify that one statement that you made about you said it would completely eliminate our housing scholarships? Men's basketball housing scholarships would be completely eliminated okay, within just the that division one, not all two. Of them, just, yeah. We would maintain housing scholarships for both men's and women's soccer programs. I, I anticipate it would be about a $75,000 reduction when you consider the scholarship and the consolidation of some travel. Uh, one final topic, uh, perhaps you've heard about this in the media. Uh, Coach Rooney is retiring for the second time. And this time I think he means it. Um, he's had some health setbacks uh, recently and he's convinced it's time to go. Um, we, we plan to throw a, um, I guess I would call a mild celebration for his second retirement. And we certainly invite you to come out Saturday to enjoy both uh, teams as they play Parkland College here at home at noon and 2 p.m. That concludes my report. I want to congratulate you on uh, thinking about <clears throat> teaming up with the hospital for the athletic trainers, it seems like that's a very plausible and efficient way to handle that issue. Yeah, we're, we're in a temporary state with that, but it's, it's been very beneficial to our athletes to have that game day coverage. Thank you, Doug. Appreciate it. Gary? And Greg, and then we've got foundation update with Deb, and then I'll pull it all together with my update, hopefully. Good evening. I'll be uh, quick. I uh, wanted to update you on the um, this year's water festival, which was held at the uh, the end of September. As you know, that's a, um, a jointly sponsored community college and Grick uh, event. Um, it started some 20 years ago with the college, and uh, shortly thereafter, Ingrick adopted it and took the lead on uh, that outreach and education event. This year's event was held virtually because of the pandemic, and that made it a little bit more difficult. And so uh, our numbers were down. We had about 250 uh, students that were reached through the event and multiple teachers. Uh, normally that event reaches 450 to 600 or so uh, students. Uh, we're in the planning process for next year, and we, we hope to get back to a live in-person event uh, uh, next September. So um, I was pretty pleased, though, that uh, the virtual event did bring that many, many students into the uh, 
into the program. So I think that was, uh, that was good. Uh, on a second note, I uh, just wanted to report that uh, our Walton Family Foundation funding continues this year. Uh, we were refunded at the $800,000 level, which is an increase uh, over the preceding year. And basically what that funds is our efforts to uh, create a nationwide water quality integrated database where we can make available to organizations in all of the surrounding states in the Mississippi watershed uh, comprehensive data sets, more efficient, more timely data uh, to be more effective in on the ground management of uh, agricultural practices, land use practices. Uh, suburban building practices, whatever it may be. Uh, so we've developed a, a wonderful relationship with, uh, with the Walton Family Foundation. They have uh, about a $20 million total investment in uh, different efforts within the Mississippi River watershed and really about the same amount of money invested in the Colorado River Basin as well. Uh, the Walton Family Foundation is the single largest investor in freshwater systems uh, of all of the foundations. So um, our relationship there I think is strong and we're also in discussions to become uh, the, uh, the evaluator for the Midwestern or the Mississippi Watershed Program. Uh, there are 20 to 40 projects that are funded at any time uh, by the Walton Family Foundation. And so we're talking about becoming the uh, sort of intermediate evaluator to help them craft the optimum program for investment in the Mississippi River watershed. So if that comes about, then our, our funding will uh, increase uh, proportionally. I also wanted to mention that our intern program was pretty successful this year with the uh, National Science Foundation um, research experience for undergraduates as well as our internal uh, program that uh, that worked uh, pretty well this year but because we now have uh, the NSF funded program we're going to focus that program on the summer and we're going to focus our traditional income program uh, intern program on the fall and spring semester so we'll be announcing shortly uh, beginning in the uh, for the spring semester uh, internship opportunities for Lewis and Clark students uh, historically uh, the numbers have not been where we would like them to be, so this year we're going to uh, make an extra effort to recruit Lewis and Clark students for an intern experience that would extend throughout the spring semester and could in fact extend through the summer as well. And as always, this will be a paid internship opportunity. So I want to announce that now, but we'll be putting that information out um, shortly for the spring semester. That's really all I have. If there are any questions, I'd be pleased to answer them. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Thanks, Dick. Good evening. Um, I'm Debbie Edelman with the Lewis and Clark Community College Foundation. Um, since the last board meeting when I spoke to you, the foundation has experienced um, a couple of highlights and an uptick in donations, I'm happy to say. Um, gifts for just this same time period, um, month of September, um, increased by 28% over last year, um, which probably doesn't sound like it would be difficult to do since last year was COVID and a lot was different. but. Um, gifts have actually uh, are up 48% over 2019, so I'm very happy to uh, report that. Um, this is due in part to um, an increase in giving by our foundation board members, um, a large increase in giving by our team members, so thank you all very much. <laughs> um, an increase in donations to scholarships um, through some targeted appeals. Um, an increase in donations from our alumni, um, some due to Dr. Trask's visits that he's been making. Um, retired team members, we have an uptick there, and uh, many other community members in our region. Recently, the foundation sold some property that it owns, um, resulting in a major gift. 
Um, the, uh, and last week, a new endowment was established um, by a donor um, to endow the operations of the foundation, and that requires a minimum gift of $30,000. So those two major gifts were very happily received. Just today, I had a conversation with um, yet another donor who is interested in endowing a scholarship that they fund every year. So my hope is that next month, I will be able to share that good news with you as well. Um, we're very grateful to all of our donors who advance the college's mission through their charitable giving. We are promoting scholarships for the 22-23 academic year. The College and Foundation Scholarship Program began, began accepting applications on October 1st. And um, so far, we have close to 50 applications that have been started and or completed. And you may recall that the way students apply for a scholarship is um, through an online application. They fill out one application and um, are automatically matched to scholarships that they qualify for. <clears throat> um, the marketing and PR department are always very, very helpful at promoting these. And I look forward to working more with Dr. Jackson and her team on promoting these scholarships and using them as an enrollment tool. The scholarship mover team suggested awarding um, some particular scholarships we have for valedictorians in high school, salutatorians, um, and others who rank at the top of their class. Um, they suggested awarding those scholarships in January rather than our traditional April timeframe so that we can be more competitive with the other higher education institutions that are vying for those students' attention. So, um, we will, um, I'll look forward to reporting on success there. Uh, <clears throat> um, every year, roughly 25 students um, in that group accept our scholarships and enroll at Lewis and Clark. Um, the total value of these scholarships is more than $100,000 annually, and we'd really like to see them move the needle on improving enrollment. Um, some of these are two-year scholarships, and we know that that makes a difference with retention as well. Um, in other news, the alignment of the college and foundation strategic plan is underway and um, actually under review. The alignment document provides examples of um, accounts or funds that the foundation has that could contribute to some very specific um, key college directions and aspirations. <clears throat> I'm pleased to say that the foundation isn't waiting for the document to be sanctioned um, in order to support some of the college's new initiatives. Um, for example, the foundation agreed to underwrite the Friday Night Lights event that Dr. Artis invited you to. We're very happy to do that. I hope you all can join us, and I'll buy you a free hot dog if you do. The foundation board meets again on December 15th, um, and if there are, are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. And I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with, with my update here. Um, a couple of things. Uh, it was brought up at, at our uh, leadership team a couple of weeks ago, um, and we decided to have kind of a spin-off discussion with a number of us, including faculty leadership around an early retirement incentive. And if that was something the college would entertain moving forward this year, it was decided uh, earlier this week that we would not do that at this time. However, we agree that we would develop an early retirement incentive policy, which would help guide uh, leadership, um, leadership thinking and evaluation of need and why we would do it on any particular year, and then therefore inform any, rec inform any recommendation to our board moving forward. So our plan would be within the next couple of months to draft that policy and bring it to the board no later than the December board meeting, I think is what we agreed. Um, and then implementing that policy in the spring. Um, we, are, we are close. We meet again next week, our leadership team, um, on a final recommendation to the board for the Manny Jackson Center for Humanities. I think we have a, a really solid proposal that we'd like the board to consider, and the plan is to bring that recommendation to the board in November. Um, we did this week, uh, just a couple of days ago, our vice president for student affairs, uh, agreed upon a final candidate. So uh, once our human resource team uh, finalizes their 
protocols of background checks and, of course, negotiating in agreement with our candidate, uh, we will be able to announce and bring that recommendation to our board for consideration at the November board meeting. Another one that uh, Dr. Lane sort of alluded to, and it's, it's somewhat coupled um, with the idea of looking at this, this strengthening of alignment between our current tech programs, workforce development training, and um, academics is something that is going to be on the leadership team agenda next week. Um, this is a way to streamline services, uh, become more efficient. Um, and when I use the word efficient, it's being efficient, but also more, I think, effective in our ability to serve communities. Um, one of the biggest vulnerabilities is I talked a little bit about when, when Brett, uh, uh, Dennis, and um, Charisse gave the update on enrollment, was some of these vulnerabilities that our rural communities face. And um, creating, and, and also if we look at the data and looking at that, that group, what is it, 35 to 49 years old, year old age group, and it, whether it's retraining, going for a promotion, upskilling, this sort of competency-based education piece, which you know we will be implementing in spring, and then broadening that to other areas is a huge opportunity for us. So with the alignment of workforce development, community education, and academics, there could be some really, really interesting opportunities there. And that is, is probably a way overdue model for us in education, so we're looking forward to some really good discussion and how that may look moving forward. The other part of that, which I was going to mention, is when I was in Chicago about a month ago, um, the meeting that I was at, or the announcement I was at, was at a place called the Revolution Workshop, which is a concept of pre, uh, uh, pre-apprenticeship, apprenticeship, and journeyman around construction trades. And this is a model that I was very impressed with. Um, and so we're putting together a small sort of delegate from, from Lewis and Clark to go down and really look at that model and try to look at how that model or characteristics of that model may be able to inform some opportunities in our rural communities, but also our East St. Louis location, um, where we have some opportunities there to engage the community at a deeper level and provide opportunities for you know, mobility toward education or jobs, et cetera. So um, that hopefully will happen the first week of November. And if it happens before the next board meeting, we'll be able to report back on some of the outcomes of that meeting. I've already reached out to the executive director and he's looking forward to our visit. Um, I know it was mentioned, uh, some of the work going on with high school visits. I'll be starting next week and I'm going out to, to I think, a handful or two of high schools. I think one in two nights. Um, and I'm gonna be in the gym and I'm gonna fire the families and the students up who are interested in attending Lewis and Clark, talk a little bit about what a special place this is and the opportunities we have. And uh, on some of those trips, uh, some faculty may come along with me, some other team members. Um, and so I'm really excited about sort of doing that, doing my part, so to speak, and in helping really promote the good work that we're doing and the opportunities that are at Lewis and Clark. Um, last week, I had a chance to revisit, uh, I think, I hit maybe 10 high schools, uh, met with superintendents and principals to really start looking at beginning to activate some of the things we've been talking about for about six months in terms of you know, team members actually being placed in the high schools, looking at some of these career and technical education pathways. Um, we have some vulnerabilities there, folks, and, and we have some of, our, some of our schools in our current district going to other locations to, to get education and get training. And so we have to capture those individuals, we, you know, in, in, in the sense that we have to get them here um, and not allow them to literally, in some cases, and I mean this in a literal sense, drive right by Lewis and Clark. Um, I mean, we just, we just can't allow that to happen. So um, I think some really good work and some concepts are being put in place to think about how we can address that. Um, I'm trying to think of a couple of other things. Um, Tomorrow I leave for San Diego and I'm going to the uh, American, uh, uh, the Association of Pina Couch Trustee Conference, which is sort of a president trustee conference, um, and also hosting a couple of alumni events. So I wanted to thank Debbie for coordinating those. And I know we, we have some, some exciting alumni attending and I'm looking forward to getting to know them um, and really talking about the great value Lewis and Clark is. And of course, talking about some of our needs and opportunities that exist. So. Um, just a lot of really great work going on, and I just, again, want to extend my gratitude to the team and to the board and to everyone in the community for your support and, and confidence in the work that we're doing, but also understanding that the work we have in front of us won't be easy, but we have the right team in place to make it happen. So thank you, and that concludes my update. 
Does that also <coughs> conclude your mover team? No, report? actually it doesn't. I can introduce Cody, who's who's on. I have a, I have a question. I I, yeah. I I missed I missed when you were planning to uh, email the details of the Lincoln School proposal to the board. I'm sorry. The when are you planning to email the proposal the proposal the Lincoln School proposal oh. details to the board? Yeah, I'll bring that to the board in November. Um, but I will send a pre message to you know, once we we have our leadership team meeting next week, right, Sue? The following week, yeah. So once that's finalized, there I'll send that off to the board and then it'll okay, be brought so we, to so we will get to see the details before the yeah I'm, yeah yeah and yeah yeah and and i've talked to several of you about some of those details i mean you know essentially the concept is and i'm happy to share it the concept is there's kind of a trifecta approach so you know we had the, the, the community forums um we have the college presence piece that we want to hold on to and then we have an opportunity to lease part of that building um and I think to uh, at least the numbers I have, it would cover not only our expenses, but generate some revenue for the facility. Also allow us to keep, I think a really important connection with our community, so access for our community. We do have at least one uh, lease agreement uh, with Manage Action Center, which is an organization that accesses the facility, I believe over the weekends. Um, that we hope can continue um, in addition to other opportunities where we may be able to provide um, access to organizations that are looking to use the facility and pay a fee. Um, and then of course the college presence would be that we would be there. Um, and I'm looking at uh, Maya Lawrence, who's our director of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusive excellence, as well as perhaps another team member um, over at the Anno Nelson campus who would share some space there to help oversee and facilitate the work. Now, I don't wanna get into the details because we're fleshing all of that out, but we, we're trying to find a model that allows us to remain engaged in Edwardsville. As you saw from the data today, Edwardsville is arguably one of our most opportune areas in terms of enrollment growth and partnership growth. Um, so that was also a factor in our discussion, but we'll, we'll send that out to the board and I'm certainly open to any side discussions if, if we need to have those, if there are questions or concerns. I, I try to check in with all of you as much as I can. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, this is a discussion we're having as a full leadership team, and uh, we won't bring anything forward unless the leadership team is all in agreement, um, and that will be the only delay. So if for some reason there was uh, some concern, but at this point, based on our initial meeting, the pitch to the team based on all the feedback I've received, the organizations I've met with, um, it seems that we're all in agreement that uh, this is in the best interest of our community, our college, and of course, the opportunities in Edwardsville. So didn't mean to get into that detail, but you know, I'm, I'm willing to answer any questions, but that's where we're at. I would hope probably that first week of November, I could get a message out as kind of an update to the board and saying, here's what you can expect to see. And you know, we'll see where it goes from there, but that's where we're at at this point. So, thank you. You said mover team reports? Yep, yeah, so uh, Cody uh, Zipman should be on. Cody, are you on? Or do we lose the... <laughs> That's us, so it's good to see everyone. I, I did send him a text and he did text me back. Oh. So as we're waiting for Cody, he's gonna update us on a new uh, mover team that met recently um, that really underpins a lot of the culture building work that we're trying to do here on campus. And so I'm really excited for you to hear the work that, that they're doing and the vision that really he's trying to facilitate through, I think what might be our biggest active mover team. I think I read there's something like 25 people that were invited on this team particularly. So pretty exciting stuff. While we're waiting, are there any questions for? He's talking, but can I, nobody he? can hear him. <laughs> can we unmute him? Oh well.
He says he's talking. No, can't, can't get him. It's on his end. Yeah. Well, if we can't get him, we'll, we'll put it forward to next time, if that's okay, just to give him a fair opportunity to present. So if that's the well, case, we, we still have uh, our friends from AAIC, Brick, and the maintenance department. And I was wondering if any board members or anyone in attendance here tonight has a question for them. I do want to thank uh, AAIC, Brick, and the maintenance department for leading us through the uh, visit. I think it was very informative, and uh, I've heard a lot of positive uh, statements with regard to your being here and, and leading us through and introducing us to the possibilities that are down the road. Thank you very much for coming. If there is no other business, we stand adjourned. Thank you, everyone.